from the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors Conservative Roundtable. Our guest is Mark Morano, who's had a very interesting career. Uh, he helped uh, destroy John Kerry as a uh, swift boater. Uh, he's helped destroy Al Gore by showing the fraud of uh, uh, supposed uh, climate change. He runs a website called Climate Depot, and uh, at one point he was a communications director for the GOP on the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. He worked with a great U.S. Senator, Jim Inhofe. Uh, he was Washington representative for Rush Limbaugh. Uh, he was known as Limbaugh's man in Washington, reporter and producer for the Limbaugh television show as long as it lasted. And uh, he's a former correspondent and producer for American Investigator, the nationally syndicated TV news magazine. I have to ask you, uh, Mark Morano, what do you have against global warming? This has been one hell of a hot summer. <laughs> and it was one hell of a cold winter. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this is what happens. We have hot summers and we have cold winters, and sometimes you have mild winters and cool summers. And a few years ago, we had one of the coldest summers on record. Um, but what's interesting about it is when you have these cycles, most people have always just chalked it up, the old expression, you, you can't control the weather. Well, Al Gore is now claiming that record snow and blizzards is proof of man-made global warming. Whatever the weather, it's exactly what we would have expected with global warming. And this is what we're finding across the board. Al Gore, in two months, in, in, in September of this year, is going to have a 24-hour campaign to make you think that every flood, drought, hurricane, tornado, heat wave, blizzard, record cold spell is all proof of the theory. But he's wrong. He's absolutely wrong. One scientist said this is akin, global warming science is now akin to the predictions of Nostradamus in the Mayan calendar. Uh, that's where they've reduced themselves to. And, and what I, was wrong with that? Well, <laughs> well, those can be many things, but most people don't consider them part of the scientific method. <laughs> And one note, on my resume, you left off that I worked for the Conservative Caucus back in the Independent Voters I, Party. I did not want to embarrass you, <laughs> but uh, Mark is on the board of directors of the yeah. Conservative Caucus and was at one time an employee of our employee. great organization. And, Mark, we're delighted that you're still talking with us and working with us despite yes, that yeah. association. <laughs> uh, but and, and you asked me the question about heat waves and Al Gore. Uh, Right now, the man-made global warming movement, I run the website Climate Depot, and I, I, I do this on a daily basis, from literally A to Z, the case that Al Gore presented and the United Nations presented is collapsing scientifically. And we can go through from the Antarctic, Adonair record sea ice extent, to the Arctic, uh, which has recovered from its low point, and new studies are out that even the New York Times mainstream liberal environmental reporter now says he's no longer worried about an Arctic ice death spiral. Mount Kilimanjaro gaining ice, polar bears, add on our record uh, um, population highs, sea level, not only is it decelerating, it's actually dropping by some monitors. Global temperature, the high point still 1998. Studies of uh, debunking the idea that there was no medieval warm period. The medieval warm period was likely warmer than today without SUVs. So we go through this. Today we had a story on cholera showing that it is not caused by global warming. Almost every single claim they've made, the science is refuting it, and their own scientists are refuting it now. How can so many scientists be so astray? Well, it's not so many, and that's, that's the illusion that they paint. These thousands of scientists, this, uh, this consensus, the National Academy of Sciences, the American Meteorological Society, all these groups representing tens of thousands of scientists, they endorse the United Nations. Howard, it turns out these are two dozen governing board members of these organizations that issue a statement that agrees with the United Nations without ever directly polling their members, without most of the members even knowing this happened. In the case of the American Meteorological Society, uh, a survey of its members found 75 percent reject man-made global warming, either don't believe it or are agnostic on it, and yet the board of directors uh, goes along and says that they all agree. 
In the case so of the hierarchies are out of touch with the lower archies. Absolutely. The rank and file are dissenting. In the case of the National Academy of Science, and this is the most repulsive corruption, there's a man named Ralph Cicerone, who's the president of the National Academy of Science, our once esteemed science body, is started by Abraham Lincoln. This L Lincoln started. This is the started guy back eighteen. Uh, I can't remember what year. Eighteen sixties, early eighteen sixties, obviously. Before Lincoln. he was killed. Yeah. Before he was killed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this this National Academy of Sciences took six million dollars from Congress to study climate change, and then turned around and lobbied the, for a congressional climate bill. And this is something that one scientist, Richard Lindzen of MIT, said: if the national, if Congress wants the National Academy of Science to say global warming is a problem, by God, they're paid to say it. This is the corruption we have in the science. In the case of the United Nations, these are scientists handpicked by governments who want a piece of the pie that the United Nations wants to divvy up from carbon taxes and carbon trading. So all these scientists that they pick, and it's only 52 that uh, that are the key nucleus of this entire organization that that author these summary for policymakers. Uh, are all handpicked by government, making sure they agree. And in the other case you have, they, someone did a survey once, and the joke was, yeah, of government-funded scientists, yeah, there's a nearly unanimous consensus that they all agree that you know, this is a problem and they need more money to study it and we're, we better watch out. So it was an illusion of consensus from the beginning. And what's happened is I just did a report of over 1,000 international scientists dissenting. The blowback has been Tremendous. Former United Nations scientists, Nobel Prize winners, two scientists just this, just this summer in Australia, mainstream climate scientists, uh, came out and, and announced their dissent for the first time. One, a Professor Salby is going to get a study which is going to turn, potentially revolutionize the entire climate debate, showing that temperature goes up before CO2. It's not the cause and effect that Al Gore wants you to believe, that the more CO2, the higher the temperature necessarily. How did Al Gore get involved in this? Well, Al Gore goes way back with this. You know, as you as you know, he was a tobacco farmer. He hoed it. He, you know, that whole speech he gave. He um, in Congress, he started. Uh, he started Armand Hammer gave him his territory. That's right. Yes, and he started out in Congress as a relatively conservative member. I mean, he was a pro-life Tennessee, and they have they have evidence back in the mid '80s when he was a congressman that he was a pro-lifer. By 1992, obviously, he had switched to the environment. He wrote his book, Earth in the Balance. And if you go back, it's you know, I think it was the late Tony Snow. Uh, who did the comparison of the Unabomber's manifesto with Al Gore's Earth in the Balance, and you couldn't tell the difference between their ideology, this sort of anti-human... Uh, the Unabomber was a <laughs> classmate of mine at Harvard. Oh, that's right. He had a yeah. famous class at yeah. Harvard, yes. So Al Gore got involved that way, and then once he lost the presidency, you know, this was his, uh, his way of coming back. This was his ticket to glory again, his revival, if you will. And he wrote it, and he wrote it hard. I came in the Senate, United States Senate Environment and Public Works Committee in 2006, we, with Senator Inhofe, and we knew instinctively, instinctively, that this was a doomed movement for two simple reasons. A movement that has a polarizing political figure like Al Gore, love him or hate him, you can't lead a moral crusade, uh, a bipartisan crusade with a candidate that divisive. And the second huge mistake they made is having the scandal-ridden United Nations with no one trusts as the source, or as John Kerry would say, the gold standard of science. You have Al Gore as the face, the UN, the corrupt UN as your source of science. That is thumbs down, doomed to failure, and that's exactly what happened. We watched the whole movement peak in 2006 and 7, and then utterly collapse. By a fall of 2009, there were more Americans believed in haunted houses than man-made global warming. That was a month before the Climate Gate scandal broke. We had already achieved victory before the Climate Gate scandal. The Climate Gate scandal blew all hell to loose at that point. What is Al Gore's next issue? <laughs> well, he's sticking with this. What he's done is since, as I mentioned, A to Z, they're, ha they're having a little problem with all their issues, they're now morphing this into climate astrology. Now, you have bad weather, they're telling poor Africans who are barely getting by that that drought that they had, uh, first of all, they're telling them two things. A, it's caused by wealthy white Westerners driving SUVs. They're affecting your weather. This is a level of pagan uh, earth worship that we haven't seen for thousands of years on earth going mainstream. But they're also telling them, in the case of Africans, they're telling women and families in Malawi, the United Nations is on record as telling them that global warming is causing your children to become prostitutes. Because as the weather becomes more dire and the crops fail, they're forced to go to other means and their daughters are becoming hookers and sex trade workers. 
This is the mentality that they're actually saying. And despite the fact that evidence is showing no increase in drought floods, huge tornadoes, if anything, have dropped dramatically since the 70s. We're in a low, of a 50-year energy low for hurricanes. And not only that, we're the longest period since before the Civil War of no landfall hurricanes hitting the United Nations. Yet we're supposed to believe we're in extreme storm disaster right now. It is, it is turned everything on its head, turns the scientific method, science on its head. And it's actually a joy to watch. The more Al Gore speaks, the more people like James Hansen, NASA's lead scientist, who actually came out and announced, he, he endorsed a book <coughs> calling for the deindustrialization of the United States. NASA's lead global warming scientist is espousing views similar to the Unabomber, talking about blowing up dams and leveling Kaczynski, stuff. Chad yeah. Yeah, this is, this is where we are. And once you start exposing this, it just goes like wildfire to even Democrats are growing skeptical. 111 countries survey the majority of the human race, according to Gallup, is skeptical. Well, I Mark, sound like I'm selling something here, but, you know, excited. Uh, Mark, I'm, <laughs> it's good to know that you feel strongly about this issue because it offsets the rather mild position of Al Gore. It, uh, it, it helps neutralize Gore. Well, I want to hear more about this. And we're going to hear more from Mark Morano after we take this break. Mark, I appreciate your fervent analysis of what's happening. Stay with us and we'll be back with more of Mark Morano. You are a defender of liberty. You spoke out. That's part of your job. You were heard in Tell Congress. No. You marched. You created a new movement. You endured attacks. You see folks waving tea bags around. Now you can help to repeal the bill. Go to sendthemamessage.com. Print the pledge to repeal Obamacare. Send it to your representative senators and candidates to sign that they pledge to repeal the bill 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 now go to send them a message.com and help repeal the bill Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips of the Conservative Caucus with Mark Morano. <coughs> Mark, tell us about uh, some of the other problems in addition to phony global warming, problems affecting the Environmental Protection Agency, sure. energy, et cetera. Well, here's the deal. Even though I'm sounding pretty optimistic here talking about the death of global warming, the science is collapsing, Gore is frustrated, one problem is that in the last three years of Obama, we spent $90 billion, according to ABC News, on green energy inspired by global warming fears. Now, what is green energy? Green energy, to make it very simple, is the new ideology. This is, the, this is being drilled into kids' heads about windmills and solar panels, uh, and, and it's all about we need to get off this carbon-based fuels and carbon-based energy is evil. Mayor Bloomberg in New York is bragging that he's giving money to environmental groups and he's bragged that he's stopped hundreds of coal plants. Half of our electricity comes from coal-fired power plants. And natural gas revolution is another thing happening here. But what's going on, and it's infected the Republican Party, it's infected the Bush administration, it's infected many Republicans in our government policy, we're subsidizing energy that doesn't produce energy, and we're banning energy that, that actually works. Carbon-based energy is one of the greatest liberators of, of human beings on our planet and our history. It's brought us out of a nasty, brutish, short life, given us longer life expectancy, lower infant mortality, modern medicine, running water, uh, modern sewage systems. And it also gives you a cleaner environment. If you go into Africa, the people in huts, in huts of dung burning uh, feces are getting higher rates of cancer now because they're breathing, they're breathing all this in. Many studies are showing that. So what's happened is we're building, we're promoting windmills. And people say if only windmills could compete with coal plants and natural gas. Well, windmills 
have been around since the 13th century. And once the advent of coal-fired power came, they had their rear ends kicked. Wind power had its rear end kicked. And it isn't producing the energy. In fact, in the UK, it's using more energy, costs more in the winter to uses more energy in the winter to heat the windmills than they're actually producing. And then solar panels, the same thing. It's, this, it's an ideology of people supporting energy that doesn't work. Our government is deeply entrenched in it. Hmm. What's the Environmental Protection Agency up to? Environmental Protection Agency is up to two damaging things. I'll get to the uh, carbon-based car CO2 regulations in a moment. The other thing that the, their government's doing, the Energy Department the regulatory, is Energy Star mandates. They've destroyed the American washing machine. Consumer reports in the late 90s, every washing machine passed the test. The most recent consumer reports, because they're sapping them of water and energy, even the high-end washing machines are failing. They're now going after ice makers. They've gone after shower heads. They've already got our toilets. They're going after our light bulbs. The other thing that Obama has done, they've gone after and destroyed the American light truck industry. They're going after heavy trucks next. But the SUV is dead. 50-some mile an hour uh, per gallon standards coming in just a little over a decade. Republicans are silent on this. They're just regulatorily reshaping America without a single vote. Or they, I mean, a lot of these were voted on as part of bulk bills, but people aren't aware of it. Uh, in terms of what the EPA is doing right now, the United States Supreme Court in a bizarre um, moment said that carbon, carbon dioxide could be regulated as a pollutant. We inhale oxygen, exhale carbon dioxide. First time now we're going to be regulating what we exhale from our mouth, and Obama administration is sitting on this at the moment. And if he gets reelected, that'll be one of the first things regulatorily he does. Uh, and there's ways to fight it. Lawsuits in the biggest way, and you've always talked about this, is defund, defund, defund the EPA. Um, and unless we get someone like a Michelle Bachman in who's actually making that a platform, or Rick Perry makes that a platform, I don't think it's even like I don't think it's likely. Because let's ever. not forget it was Richard Nixon who gave us the EPA. That's right. Well, let's talk about Republicans. I would argue that the two Bushes have been more damaged to our country than all the Democrats the last 30 years combined. You could probably include, I don't know if you'd include Jimmy Carter in that or not, but certainly the first Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, signed us on to the United Nations uh, Earth Summit Rio Treaty and the Biodiversity Treaty, which then led to the Climate Treaty, which then led to all this. The second Bush, and it's nauseating to watch this. I was at the United Nations conferences in South America and Africa watching the Bush administration pander to the United Nations concede all the science on this issue, continue to fund all the corrupt institutions and all the corrupt scientists that were massive ideologues like James Hansen, and continue to do that at the same time, increase all these mandates and talk about how we could solve global warming with windmills. It was just fanciful, utter nonsense. And now we have the, the hair to George Bush is no, none other than the front runner right now, Mitt Romney, who's taken up George Bush's rhetoric of, I accept the science of global warming, but I'm not really going to do anything about it. So here he is. He accepts Al Gore's vision so much so that Al Gore praised Romney, but he's not going to do anything about it. Do we trust him on that? Uh, and then you have, going through the other list, Michelle Bachman's very solid. Ron Paul's very solid. Rick Santorum is solid. Um, Newt Gingrich sat on a sofa with Nancy Pelosi in 2008 and called for action on climate change. He refused to apologize. I got the New York Times, the Associated Press, to go and cited to go after Newt Gingrich. He finally recants and says he, sh he now regrets having sat on the sofa, but he only regrets it because people like me misunderstood that he was actually wanted, that he wanted a seat at the table to debate people, and that's why he sat there and called for action on climate change. Newt Gingrich is a psychological nightmare to try to figure out. Um, as you move beyond Newt Gingrich, uh, Rick Perry seems very solid on this issue. I know a lot of conservatives, and particularly in Texas, are not happy with him on some social issues, even budget issues. Uh, but in terms of uh, the other, who's the other, who's the other major candidate? John Huntsman is a, basically an Al Gore light when it comes to this. I don't think, I, my quote on John Huntsman was, it's not that GOP voters will reject him, it's that they won't even consider him at all. I don't think he's anything other than a 1 or 2 percent player that the left loves to say, oh, here's a Republican we can like. Um, any other que any questions you want to leave me on here? Well, uh, what other <coughs> Republican candidates meet with your approval or disapproval? What about Chris Christie? Oh, what yes. about uh, uh, Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman? Sarah Palin's very good on this issue. I was disappointed when Sarah Palin was picked as VP that she sort of backed away and got all hesitant because she had been strongly correct on the science of man-made global warming. Uh, Bachman is very solid on this. 
Chris Christie is a shocker. He's a Tea Party favorite. He's made his reputation on video, YouTube video clips of him arguing with union officials. And I still go out and speak to groups, and they're shocked. They think Chris Christie is you know, the second coming when it comes to Ronald Reagan, when it comes to politics. And the reality is he announced that he fully accepts now the science of man-made global warming. He only met with scientists promoting climate alarm from Rutgers University in New Jersey. He rejected scientists from Princeton, including Freeman Dyson and Will Happer, two of the most esteemed scientists. Will Happer's done over 200 peer-reviewed studies, testified in Congress, refused m multiple requests for meetings with skeptics, announced he endorsed the science of man-made global warming, at the same time announced he was banning coal, coal mines coal production in New Jersey and was erecting worthless, symbolic, nonsensical windmills, offshore windmills in New Jersey. He's, he's, he's infected with this pandering uh, when it comes to energy and climate, and it's really sad because it's a non-starter for many grassroots Americans, particularly in the Tea Party, to have someone like that. What about Ron Paul? Ron Paul has been always solid on this issue. He hasn't made it a, he hasn't made it a huge issue, rarely ever talks about it, but when he does, he's right on and is, is exactly right. It's about defunding. Uh, with, with the EPA, they actually, what's funny about this is the Tea Party Congress, as they'll try to say, came in the first year, didn't do that much. They kept saying, wait till next year, wait till next year. Well, it's like your favorite sports team. They, they lose, they don't make the playoffs, wait till next year. There is no next year. If you look back at the history, Ronald Reagan and the GOP Congress in 94, they have basically one year, maybe two, to get most of their agenda passed. And after that, you're nothing more than caretakers of big government at best or you're capitulating beyond that after that. And that's where we are now with this Congress. I don't expect, I, I, I expect the Tea Party is going to have their, you know, it's, it's slap in the face reality pretty soon here with this Congress. Mark, it's good to uh, have someone as a guest who is not only well informed, but who has strong views on these Thank issues. You. We're going to have to take a break. When we come back, you'll have a minute or two to talk about the issues that are of greatest concern to you. So stay with us. We'll be right back with our special guest, Mark Morano, a member of the board of the Conservative Caucus. Hey, listen. This is the greatest thing. I want to tell you something. Something's happening in this country. And I want to tell you, look, at, look around my friends here. My friends here in Washington, come over here. See all these great people? <laughs> these great folks are here because they want to take the country back to the direction of the Founding Fathers and stop all this nonsense that's going on and stop this, uh, you know, this uh, immersion into socialism which is happening. We've got to stop it. And every day we're losing a little bit of our freedom. But the, the answer is that the, the, that the individual citizens can make a difference. They can walk through these houses of Congress. They can look, at, look their congressmen in the eye and say, hey, vote this bill down. Get rid of it. We got a lot of work to do, and the, the first thing we have to do is get rid of the garbage and the attacks on our freedoms. This is it. So anyway, that's what these guys are doing here today to do. Yes. And uh, and I say all of you guys out there, where it was the sound of my voice and the and the you know the visual that you're cre that this great gentleman has created, get down here and do your do your. Uh, responsible citizenship by going and seeing your representatives and telling them, you know, what you want, because this is, this is your house. It's not their house. Yeah. Get in there and tell them what to do, and let's, uh, let's begin cleaning this country up. A, a big yes. mess has been created in only a year's time, in nine months' time, really. A big mess we have to recover from. We've got to start work. We've got to throw some people out. So anyway... I love this country. I love you. Go do your job. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Welcome back. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, please send us contact information. Our fax is 703-281-4108, or drop us a note at 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, uh, 22180. We've been privileged to have as our guest Mark Morano, the leader 
uh, of the battle against the climate control lies. Mark, what are your concluding comments for our viewers? Well, you had asked me about the greatest threats. Obviously, I think our debt crisis is probably the number one issue we face. Um, and I think our regulatory problems when it comes to energy and environment. Not only are we going to be condemning 1.6 billion people to, to continued energy poverty by not allowing nuclear and coal plants. Obama is actually trying to prevent this in Africa. Uh, and UN treaties do the same thing. They want to keep the poor people down. White, wealthy Westerners are keeping people of color down. But beyond that, I would say the greatest friend we have of liberty is partisanship. You know, in, in many ways, I think a, a model of that is Bill Clinton's second term. If you have, uh, you know, we would have been much worse off if Bob Dole had won. Republicans will oppose something on partisanship long before they'll ever oppose it on principle. And that's why, in many ways, particularly in energy and climate, you can make the case in Obama's reelection would be better for the country than a weak-kneed Republican like Mitt Romney or others. But you're not arguing that Obama should be reelected. Not arguing he should be reelected. I'm saying, particularly on that issue, obviously foreign policy, um, you know, and other issues where he just seems to be completely disastrous, um, and and, uh, and particularly when budget issues is no debt. good. But I think you know, I think the Republicans control the purse, and if they get you know, they could they that my party we're probably better off than if. Uh, they had, you know, if we get a, uh, another Republican, and who knows? Mark, thank you so much for your well-informed analysis thank of you, what's Doug. going on. We're going to have to end the show. Yeah.